I'm going to actually give, it's, it's a good segue, because I'm going to give a snapshot as to what's happening in the United States right now relative to this global debate that Christina talked about. Because we are about to enter in the U.S. Um, an unprecedented um, policy, uh, point of our policy history by becoming the first country to legalize a currently controlled substance. And we are on the fast track to doing that. And I want to talk about some of the implications of that and where we are. So exactly what we just heard, what are our choices for policy? We are presented often in the media, and especially among pro-legalization advocates, that our only choice is sort of an all-or-nothing policy. Of we can either um, do what we've done, which is a failure, throw everybody in jail, incarcerate, or we can do something new and innovative and evidence-based and go towards legalization. But that's the debate that has been presented to the American people, and I, and I posit to you, to the people from all around the country. Frankly, the groups that are pushing for legalization, and I'm going to speak specifically to cannabis, because that's the drug that we're in major discussions of in the U.S., um, the groups have found a way to make their issue resonate with everyday people. Um, they've done a couple of things. First, it's about voting for compassion for the sick and dying with medical cannabis. It's about reducing the prison population and crime. And it's also about stimulating the economy, getting tax revenues for governments, especially at this uh, difficult economic time. These are the three ways that the legalization discussion has become mainstream. In fact, when you say cannabis legalization, and medical cannabis, you, people think of this picture. They think of somebody with a few months to live, who's dying, who needs cannabis in order to live, and with current U.S. policy would be thrown in jail if they try to use it. So um, we really need to change our policies to, to be compassionate. This is the, the picture that a lot of the American people uh, are receiving. And in fact, in 19 states now, uh, cannabis is legal for medicinal purposes and really in the majority of those states, this has turned into a de facto legalization uh, policy. So we've actually had legalization in the U.S. already, especially in a state like uh, California and a state like Colorado. I don't know if any of you have been to California or Colorado to see this, but you can um, really present with any ailment, including a small cut on your finger, a minor headache, your legs hurt. I mean, anybody in this room, I think, would qualify stress um, and, and would, is e easily able to purchase cannabis. Um, advocates have really organized across various U.S. states and around the world to push their initiatives. And they have major donors who fund and work their messages. They have secured legislative champions. When I say that, I mean leaders, politicians at all levels, local, state, national, federal, international, they have the attention of the media. Most mainstream media that cover this issue cover it with the angle that is pro-legalization. And they've also mobilized major grassroots and student supporters. So I'm talking about big student organizations around the country. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm speaking to the choir here, but certainly in the circle I go to, they are present and active, not just present, in every single academic, think tank, United Nations, international, and domestic discussion on drug policy. They are there, they are active, they are in their sharp Versace suits, and they have their data. And uh, it's very, very difficult sometimes to compete. Most of all, they have captured the sensible ground. This is, this is the brilliance of what they have done, and it really is brilliant. Um, if you oppose what they are going towards, you are automatically and successfully labeled as old-fashioned, moralistic, and extremist if you are not open to the idea of cannabis legalization. And, and what has been the result of the framing of this issue? I'm not going to go through this, but essentially in the U.S., we can track trends for 30 years in terms of in favorability of legalization across multiple generations. And the bottom line is we have unprecedented support now in the United States, about 51 support percent support for cannabis legalization. That's a very different picture than even five years ago, where we barely registered 30%. So it's been a huge, huge jump. And in fact, if it goes at the current rate that it's going, the U.S. will see 70% in favor of uh, legalization in about five years. If the generations with the same trend in the last five years go, in the next five years, we're going to see 70% 
um, support. So really it's a reality now in the world, it's a reality in the United States, of all places in the world, and it's gaining support, frankly, every year. Um, the main supporters, there are three major donors to this movement in the United States. The first is George Soros, who obviously has a very diverse portfolio of offering you know, scholarships to students to study in other countries, um, uh, working on, I think, causes that many of us would agree to, um, causes like um, uh, anti-domestic violence, um, uh, human trafficking, female genital mutilation. These are very popular and important issues. He also, though, in the United States, at least, and around the world, of course, um, has spent about 250 million U.S. dollars on legalization campaigns over the last 20 years. We also have somebody uh, by the name of uh, Peter Lewis, who founded one of the largest insurance companies in the United States. He is the principal donor now, even more than Soros, um, in the last few years of donating to legalization. And we have John Sperling, who owns or is the founder of the largest for-profit educational enterprise in the world. Um, you know, we have not only do we have private universities in the United States, which is a rare phenomenon I know throughout the world, we also have universities that are for profit, that are companies. And he owns the biggest one of those. That's called University of Phoenix. So anybody with a checkbook um, and the willingness to take a few classes online can, can do so. And, and so he's contributed over $50 million. So I think the factors that have led to this increased support in the U.S. have been a couple of things. Obviously, we have been outspent. I mean, that we don't have, haven't had for over $400 million spent on our, on our cause. But I also think that anti-drug advocates have a messenger problem. What do I mean by that? I mean that the people that are transmitting the messages of drug policy really are not do not look like a lot of the same people, frankly, that are voting, that are growing in numbers around the world in terms of young people. So in other words, we have an older, frankly, uh, population that work and study on drug policy and a younger population that is in, in, interested in legalization. And so when, when the average person sees this, if the average person is younger than they were you know, a generation ago who cared about these issues, that's a problem. And really, again, and I'm going to say this over and over again, they are seen and framed as very sensible. This is a sensible alternative. This is nothing radical. Um, frankly, I think those who have worked, and I have been in this field for a very long time, those who have worked, including myself, on this, we are often defensive about things. We um, haven't been able to realize sometimes where we've had problems with drug policy. And so when we don't admit where we have problems, that leaves a lot of openings uh, for others to expose. Um, frankly, I feel like oftentimes we become the party of no. So we're, you know, no drugs, you know, no this, no that, and really we're no fun, is how we're, is how we're um, looked at. And, and so that's a problem. Um, you know, from a PR point of view, that's a problem. Um, we really are losing, especially in the United States, a lot of key groups to this issue that frankly were on our side 10 years ago. Um, and it, it's certainly in the U.S., racial minorities, women, uh, new immigrants, independents, and conservatives that have all traditionally realized that, that we should not have legalization, frankly, they're now th thinking about it again. Because again, this is being seen as a frame, as an alternative. So now we have two U.S. states that have officially legalized cannabis. Um, and here, let me go forward. So I, I'm going to argue, though, that we really need a rebranding in a lot of the things that we do. We actually need to talk about a smart approach. So it's not about legalization. It's also not about over-incarceration. I don't think anybody should be proud of a high incarceration rate. That's not the kind of society we want to create. So we can be against legalization, but also in favor of health, education, and common sense. Um, we can also be against discriminatory laws. So does it really make sense to have laws that, for example, in the United States, target African Americans and Hispanics at a rate 10 times more than they target white men? Um, so uh, frankly, we should reclaim reform. Because if you think about it, if you want to actually have prevention in every community and you want to have treatment to everybody who needs it, wants it, and requests it, that's radical. That's actually reform, but we don't frame it as reform. 
we get boxed in as status quo, when in reality that is reform. We should talk about that. Frankly, this is about what psychologists call a permission structure, and some of you might have heard of this before. Um, and, and what a permission structure, for example, is that medical cannabis in the United States gave people that never were in favor of marijuana, it gave them the permission for themselves to be okay with marijuana, generally. I'm gonna give you an example. My aunt is 83 years old. She has been a, never used cannabis in her life. She's been anti-drug, grew up in an era that was very anti-cannabis. She has to call me last year to ask me if she should use medical cannabis because she had cancer. And I said, well, where did you hear about that? Why would you think that? And she said, well, I went around the internet and I've talked to people, you know, her own peers, and their own children have said this works and maybe it does work. Maybe, maybe I'm okay with marijuana, actually. Of course, she talked to her doctor and her doctor said, that's ridiculous, you should not take cannabis. But the fact that my 83-year-old aunt was entertaining that shows you, A, how far they have gone, and really B, this permission structure, how powerful it is. And we frankly need to give people the permission to oppose legalization, and we have not done that. Because people think that if you oppose legalization, you are backward thinking moralist. And they have not had the permission to, rate, frankly, be on our side. So again, I think we need a smart approach. So I started an organization with Congressman Patrick Kennedy in the US, but also we're looking at global interventions that actually do this. It's called Smart Approaches to Marijuana. And uh, the reason I bring this up is because of our four pillars that we have, uh, the numbering got mixed up, but of our four pillars, I think the most important is to inform public policy about the public health evidence regarding cannabis and regarding legalization. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that right now. First of all, in the US, our legal drugs are used far greater than our illegal ones. So 50% of Americans drink regularly, 27% of them smoke cigarettes, and only 7% of them smoke marijuana. So we know that even still, with all the support for legalization, and it seems that everybody you know, is in support of cannabis, it's still used far, far, by far fewer people than our legal drugs, which says something about our culture, but it also, also I think, says something about the effectiveness of our laws when we don't have drugs that are widely available um, and advertised, and I'm gonna come back to advertising a lot in this discussion, but when we don't have drugs that are advertised and available, we actually know that they're used less. Um, it's difficult to see, but I think if we had one truism that we could say about prevention over the last 50 years, it's that when kids think that a drug is harmful, they're less likely to use that drug. So in the 1970s, when our perceived risk of cannabis was very low, the use among high school students was very high. And as the risk, perceived risk, what people think in terms of the dangerousness of cannabis went up, use went correspondingly down. This is, it, it works in an almost perfect inverse relationship. Um, so if cannabis is paraded around as being not a big deal, then you're gonna have more users. And that's, a, that, that's something that we need to be very careful about. And actually, this is the case in other countries too. The CCAD did a report where it looked at countries where the perception of great risk was over, for example, 97%, um, uh, 98% in countries like Peru and Ecuador. Look at their use rates, 1%. In countries like Uruguay, where the perception of great risk was less, like 70%, their use was much higher. So this is, the, this is true not only in the U.S. but around the country. And the reason we care about this, because I get a lot of people who tell me, that's great, Kevin, but what's the big deal? Cannabis is not a harmful drug. It's not like cocaine or heroin. So what if more kids use it or more people use it? Why do we care? The irony of that statement and, and those questions that I get a lot is that we have learned more about cannabis in the last 15 years than we have in the last 1,500 years. And the more we've learned about it, the more harmful we've actually seen that today's strength of uh, high potency marijuana is. So ironically, as we learn more about how harmful cannabis is, less people think it's harmful and more people want legalization. That's a huge disconnect. And in my mind, I think it's because we have not been able to translate this information into everyday language that people can understand. So first of all, we should learn, and I'm sure Dr. Vera talked about this earlier, 
because he's a world expert on this, but essentially the adolescent brain is susceptible to anything, including cannabis. So, you know, it's susceptible to good things and bad things. You know, that's why you learn a language when you're five is a lot easier than when you're 50, because your brain is, is forming who it's gonna be. If you wanna learn to swim, you should learn when you're six or seven, not when you're 50 or 60, because it's gonna be much, much more difficult. Same thing with driving, same thing with anything. Your brain is forming who it will eventually be up until age 25. So when you insert drugs into that brain, there's a chance that your brain gets hijacked and you get addicted. Just like your brain could get hijacked in terms of something good, like learning another language. And for cannabis, we know that that is also harmful in terms of the places in the brain that it affects. In fact, we know that one in six kids who use, who ever use marijuana, once even, will become addicted, one in six. Um, and frankly, the, the issue is that the potency of cannabis has skyrocketed over the last 40 years. This is US samples, and I don't have cross-country comparisons, but this is really the smoking gun, so to speak, about why we're seeing the increased problems with cannabis in the US. Look at the THC content. THC is the psychoactive ingredient here in black. THC has gone from 0.5% in the early 1960s, which is what, you know, people's parents, my generation's parents were smoking at Woodstock and at Bob Dylan and, and concerts and the Grateful Dead concerts, um, to what it is today, which is about 12 to 14% average. Now, if you live in a state like California, you're not even smoking 12%, you're smoking 15 to 20%, but this is the national average over a very big, over a long period of time. Whereas the, some of the non-psychoactive ingredients, for example, a, an ingredient in cannabis that we know is called CBD, cannabidiol. Cannabidiol does not make you high. In fact, if you have cannabis with a high amount of cannabidiol in it, you actually, your, the high is reduced. Cannabidiol has almost been bred out of modern cannabis in the US and I would, I'm sure around the world, because CBD does not get you high and THC does get you high. So it's really been, it's really been skyrocketing. Um, we know that uh, it, the British Medical Journal last year, is cannabis intoxication doubles your risk of a car crash. We know the lung cancer link, which we're still learning about actually, that we're not sure about, but we do know about the lung complications at least. We also know, especially in kids, we have learning memory problems. I'm sure the famous IQ study has been talked about today. Um, and, and this is, I mean, this is remarkable. This is stuff that we never could have predicted even 10 years ago. And a big one is the relation to mental health. We are seeing, you know, increases among cannabis users, specifically of schizophrenia and psychosis, that if you were to tell people 30 years ago that they would be seeing mental health problems, and people who regularly smoke cannabis, you'd be laughed out of every single scientific conference because there was barely any evidence for it. And now we're seeing it time and time and time again. So let's look at, now we're gonna switch from the biology. I wanna talk a little bit about policy for a minute because uh, Christina touched on this a little bit. The only two examples we have of legalization in the world, in the modern world, in the modern world, um, is alcohol and tobacco. And I would argue that in the United States, and I think in most countries around the world, the use of alcohol and tobacco are much higher than the use of cannabis. We also know, again, I, this, I'm gonna point this to the US, which is often the, the, for better or worse, the global leader in these kinds of advertising trends. But in the US, industries promote addiction and target kids. Um, let's look at alcohol, for example. Well, we know that 20% of the population in the United States are, are alcoholics. They're bad drinkers. They do not handle alcohol well at all. But they consume over 90% of the volume of alcohol. Okay? So most people around the world that, that drink responsibly consume far less than the minority of people who drink irresponsibly. The funny thing is, um, we have, you know, we're famous for, our, for example, our beer commercials during our sports, beloved sports events in the U.S. And in all of these beer commercials, there's always, a, and also I, I see these advertisements in Europe and around the world, you see in fine print, you know, little tiny .01 times Roman font, 
Um, you see, enjoy responsibly, right? It says enjoy. How many of you have seen that, right? Enjoy responsibly. Yeah, very familiar. Well, the, the joke of it is, if everybody enjoyed alcohol responsibly, there would be no global industry for alcohol. They would be out of business. They don't make money from responsible drinkers. They only make money from alcoholics because that's the volume. So they rely on alcoholics for their bottom line, for their profit. Um, by the way, in the U.S., the taxes for alcohol today are a fifth. That's 20% of what they were during the Korean United States War of the 1950s when you adjust for inflation. Now, that's not an accident. That's not because somebody forgot to raise taxes. That's because in the U.S., and I would argue globally, there is a huge lobby and in industry that is there to support and make sure that the price of alcohol is dirt cheap. Because when the price of alcohol is dirt cheap, as it is today, more people will drink. What else do we know? Well, we know that big tobacco and the nicotine industry around the world targets kids and increases addiction. And this is frankly what I worry about. The marble, I would call it the marbleization of marijuana, turning it into big tobacco. You know, what's amazing to me, as in, if you, many of you know that in the 1950s and 60s in the U.S., there were all kinds of advertisements for, um, you know, for example, doctors prefer camel cigarettes, right? Or physicians say that, you know, this cigarette is, 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 is healthy. We joke about that because we can't imagine that that would be the case today. It is the case today. Go to Indonesia, go to Southeast Asia and China. You will see those kinds of ads that have been banned from the US and a lot of the Western world just right there. They've just shifted. They've gone from the Western world to the, the developing world and, and other parts of the world. And they've shifted their, who their clients are. This is what I worry about. We've actually, in the US, you know, you gotta remember, in the late 1990s, the United States almost prohibited tobacco cigarettes. Why? because we learned what they were doing to our kids for 50 years and how they, we found their documents. These are literally the documents that we dug up. R.J. Reynolds' confidential draft that talks about why are young smokers important to us? Well, because less than a third of smokers start after the age of 18. So that's what that, that's it. So if 70% of smokers start before 18, mainly when they're 14 and 15, you gotta have an industry that targets 14 year olds. You know, we learned, for example, that we, we had memos that said if our company is to survive, we must get our share of the youth market. In my opinion, this will require new brands tailored to the youth market. Okay, great, well what are those brands? Well, apple flavor cigarettes, sweet flavor cigarettes to, to appeal to girls, because it says girls like honey um, and other sweet products. Um, young people like apples because they connotate freshness. Um, talks about fruit flavored chewing products uh, that mimic candies. It suggested that we mimic candies. I mean, we even have evidence, I'm not going to read this quote, you can read it yourself, but we have evidence that the tobacco industry is interested in the legal marijuana industry. And this is the point, because a lot of you might be thinking, well, that's great, that's tobacco, what does this have to do with cannabis legalization? Well, it has to do with cannabis legalization because I firmly believe, given our appetite for advertising in the world today, we would just have a new tobacco industry if we legalized cannabis. So the campaigners who want to legalize cannabis, they give you this picture that it's really just about, you know, you and your friends being able to smoke a joint without the big, you know, big brother watching. And you just want to share a joint in your living room in the privacy of your own home once a week. What's the problem with that? Look, if cannabis legalization was about that, I really could care less. I wouldn't be focusing on it. But I know that it's not about that. It's about this. It is about big business cashing in and targeting young people. And we are foolish if we think it's going to be anything less than a multi-billion dollar global industry. Because that's what it will be. We have a couple of lessons, and I know my time is running out. Um, but I, I want to share with you some early data that we've just received from Colorado. As you know, Colorado legalized marijuana. Um, we're already seeing the advertising starting, so this isn't a theory anymore. You know, the, the commercialization is not just someone thinks that it's going to happen and it may or may not happen. It's happening. It's happening right now. We see the candy-flavored cannabis products. Um, these are 
they're called ring pots. They're shaped like cannabis, THC. Um, this is a famous breakfast food in the U.S. This is, you know, called pop tarts, which is pop tarts are problematic in themselves. They've, they've contributed to our obesity epidemic in the U.S. So you either have pop tarts that increase the obesity epidemic, or you have the marijuana version, which is pop tarts that increase the cannabis epidemic. I guess you can pick your poison. Uh, but this is THC infused uh, toast, toasted um, flavored, flavored toast basically for kids. Flavored sodas and candy bars and, and other chewables. If this isn't targeting to kids, I really don't know who it's targeting. Because the last time I checked, my parents who just celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary yesterday, and that's part of the reason why I'm late, they're not into grape and cherry soda. Just, that doesn't appeal to them. But it does appeal to my nieces and nephews who are 10 years old. And that's exactly what these products are designed to appeal to. We we're already seeing vending machines. We, we worked for 20 years to ban vending machines in the U.S. because we saw them as an easy way for young people to access tobacco. Now we're about to institute vending machines for cannabis. Well, I mean, we have. It, it absolutely makes no sense. So I'm going to make sure that you all get the data, so I don't, I'm not going to go through each slide. But the bottom line is, since we have seen this commercialization of cannabis in places like Colorado that have legalized, we're seeing skyrocketing treatment admissions, skyrocketing emergency room admissions. You might be thinking, how can people go to the emergency room for cannabis? Well, if you're 13 years old and you've never tried marijuana before and your first time of trying it is in a brownie that's infused with THC, I guarantee you, you will likely have an adverse reaction and go to the emergency room because you're taking in all of that concentrated THC right at once as you ingest it and you're not used to it. I mean, that's what we're seeing happening around the country. Um, we see drug tests in terms of the amount of marijuana in, in blood skyrocket right after the passage of legalization. These are drug tests done in the workplace and among students. So, I mean, this is, they're literally testing the amount of cannabis in the blood. Um, I mean, we could go on and on. The, crack, the doubling of an increase in car crashes uh, that occurred in Colorado after uh, commercialization, it's been a real problem. There was recently a rally in Denver, 420 rally, which was pro-cannabis. They said it would be the most peaceful rally um, in the world. Well, there were actually shots fired. I mean, frankly, I mean, you, you uh, combine America's hunger for guns with cannabis and other mind-altering substances, it's not going to be a pretty picture. I mean, it's just, it's ridiculous that we're even having this debate given what's going on in the country. This was in San Francisco. They had to, this cost a couple million dollars the city had to, for the trash collection. Remember, these are, I thought these were environmentally focused, peaceful people. Well, I mean, they had to spend a couple million dollars. So the bottom line is, we're seeing already a very heavily influenced industry come to Colorado and these other states to try and cash in. So I'm gonna um, end here, um, essentially with this argument because we, we see it all the time. Everyone says that if only we tax marijuana, we'll be able to get some money and pay for any of the increased costs. Well, we only have to look at alcohol and tobacco to see how that's working out. And how is that working out? Well, for every dollar that we gain in alcohol or tobacco revenue taxes, Right, 14 billion for alcohol, 25 billion for tobacco. We spend ten dollars more on social costs. So 185 billion for alcohol and 200 billion for tobacco. It absolutely makes no financial, let alone scientific, sense to to open this up. And people think it's a wonderful revenue maker for taxes, and and we know actually that that's not going to happen. So I think my time has probably expired. Or, what's that? Keep going? Say what? Oh, okay, all right. I've been told to keep going. I, I tried to let you out early, but I was told not to. Okay, I won't be upset if you want to leave. But I, there are a couple other st uh, uh, statistics I think are important to remember. We hear all the time that if only we treated cannabis like alcohol, we'd have less people go to jail, right? Less people involved in the criminal justice system. Well, what's the number one drug responsible for people going to the criminal justice system? Alcohol. It's not crack cocaine. Why? Because 0.3% of the population uses crack cocaine and 52% of the population uses alcohol. That means more people are going to get in trouble with a legal drug. And so in the U.S., 2.7 million people are arrested for alcohol crimes 
by the way, that don't even include violence. These are the regulatory costs of alcohol, right? Things like driving, or being publicly drunk, or selling to a minor, right? Selling to a kid. These three issues send more people to jail than all drugs combined, including marijuana. In fact, um, let's see, let's go here. Cannabis possession only is only responsible for 0.1% of people in prisons in the United States, in state prisons, which is the main prison system. So this idea that our current policies around the world or in the US of cannabis are sending everybody to prison and jail, we actually know is completely false. I mean, you go talk to law enforcement, they don't have time to focus on cannabis, frankly. They're doing a lot of other things. Um, and the idea that you know, legal is, we need legalization because it will free up criminal justice resources, especially in a country like the U.S., is not true. In fact, I wanted to come here and use this opportunity to debunk a big myth about the U.S. prison population. There's no doubt that the U.S. prison population has increased exponentially in the last 30 years. Okay, Nobody's denying that. But when you look at drug offenses, the, there was a huge increase in drug-related prison, prisoners from 1985 to 2000, really during the crack cocaine epidemic in the United States that was destroying inner city neighborhoods, that was a huge uh, stain on the American psyche in the 80s, okay? But as soon as 2000 came around, we've actually seen a decrease in the number of people going to prison for drug-related crimes. So again, we hear all the time that, that you know the U.S. is the biggest a perpetuator of, of incarceration because of drugs, and the reality is actually that, that drug-related crimes have gone down. Um, many of you have seen this landmark study by the Rand Corporation, which essentially said that the pre-tax price of marijuana, if it were legal, would be reduced by 80%. And that makes sense. We know that when goods are illegal, like, like um, cocaine or heroin or whatever, it's going to be much more expensive than if it were legal. So for cannabis, they argue that it would be an 80% drop in price. Well, an 80% drop in price, we know that there's going to be increased users because users are sensitive to price. So that's why we know consumption will actually increase. I'm going to finish with this issue of medicine and cannabis medicine because this is how all of legalization essentially started with this issue of marijuana as medicine. Um, let's look at the current situation in the U.S. for medical marijuana. First of all, less than 3% of people, and these are according to studies in the U.S., less than 3% of people with medical marijuana cards, you know, allowing them to get cannabis for medical purposes, have cancer, HIV, or glaucoma. Okay, well, what do they have? Well, the vast majority are white males in their 30s and 40s with self-diagnosed pain. In fact, a recent study was 47% were there for stress and 44% for headaches. I know I would qualify for those two. How about any of you out here? I think we would all qualify, right? Stress and headaches. Who doesn't have stress and headaches? I mean, it's really turned into a joke. Um, and the vast majority of cancer doctors and other physicians do not recommend smoking or ingesting marijuana. When is the last time you smoked the drug that you got from your doctor at a pharmacy? We don't smoke drugs, and that's just not an accepted way to deliver substances. Um, we know that in the U.S., relative to areas without them, when you have these marijuana dispensaries, they are connected to crime, youth access, and increased abuse. This one actually is, I think, one of the most pre preposterous things, that the population should be able to vote on medicine. Since when was medicine determination a democratic decision? <laughs> Medicine is determined by science, by experts who do control double-blind studies with informed consent, who test their drugs for you know, over a decade and spend a lot of money developing and making sure that the drug that's going to go to market is safe and effective. Why would you just have a referendum and vote on whether you think a drug is safe or effective? It doesn't make any sense. Finally, most major medical groups in the world and in the U.S. oppose these state-based marijuana referendum. Right. You, you shouldn't support them. That's right. So the American Medical Association, the American Cancer Society, all of these organizations are actually against it. But again, this is framed as compassionate. This is framed as something that people who are dying really need. And you know what? 
If somebody is dying with six months to, to live, I don't frankly care if they take heroin. All the more power to them. Whatever makes them feel better, frankly. But for medical policy to be able to have dispensaries sell marijuana to anybody with a toothache or a you know, foot problem or a headache makes no sense to me at all. And that is not compassionate, if you think about it. Now, this does not mean that the components of marijuana do not have medical properties. Frankly, when people ask, is marijuana medicine, the answer is yes. Parts of components of marijuana have shown to have medical value. We just don't get it by smoking the whole drug. Right? So we have already a drug that's approved in several European countries and Canada and is about to be approved in the US. That's frankly an oral mouth spray. You put a few sprays on your tongue, it does not get you high, and it's been shown effective for very extreme cancer pain and for multiple sclerosis uh, spasticity, you know, uncontrollable spasticity. And that has been approved, and it's called Sativex, and it's being studied more. It does not get you high because the THC-CBD ratio is one to one. Remember I talked about CBD earlier in terms of what is the composition of smoked marijuana. CBD, you can't find it in the marijuana you buy on the street. Well, that's because it doesn't get you high. Well, this has a lot of CBD in it. It doesn't get you high, but it actually can be very helpful. That, to me, is medical marijuana. That's, that's the real thing. Not some 20-year-old kid selling you a fat joint and saying, good luck with your cancer chemotherapy. That doesn't make any sense to me. Um, so we don't, this is the best analogy I can think of, we do not smoke opium to get the effect of morphine. Right? Morphine comes from opium. Well, why don't you just grow an opium poppy in your backyard and process it if you, you know, no, we don't do that. Thankfully, we have a scientific method that extracts that, that makes sure the dose is the same, that makes sure the morphine, if I were to get into an accident here, you know, in Moscow, is the same dosage that I would get if I were in Boston. It's standardized. We know what's inside of it. That makes sense. So why do we, why would we smoke marijuana to receive its potential medical benefits? We don't need to. But we've been told we have to, and this has been the first step to legalization. That's why doctors are not in favor of medical marijuana, but advocates are. People who want to legalize marijuana happen to be in favor of it. Well, it's all part of the campaign. So, frankly, a smart approach, and this is my last slide, might look like this. Increase community-based prevention. I wasn't able to talk about any of this stuff, but you all know this. Increase community-based prevention. Increase screening and brief interventions in health settings. What does that mean? It means that if, you're, if you send your child to the doctor, their doctor should ask them if they use drugs. And if they do, there should be an early intervention. So we don't intervene when the child has to go to the emergency room for a heroin overdose. That's getting to be pretty late. We have to intervene earlier. Increase access to treatment and recovery-oriented services and things like drug treatment courts and treatment within the criminal justice system it can be also appropriate for some people. So I, I know I went through a lot of information um, and statistics. I'm very happy to share the presentation. Please email me if you have further questions, and it was really wonderful to be able to address you today. Thank you.